The governors of northern states and the security chiefs meet over the spate of insecurity in the region. And in a crisis rocking the All Progressive Congress, Victor Gaidem has been named an imposter by the Hilliard Etta led faction. This is PLOS Politics, and I am Felicity Ezewike. You're welcome to the program. Probably in what we can call a response to the warning issued by President Muhammad Bukhari to the service chiefs over the insecurity challenges affecting the country, a meeting has taken place between the governors of the 19 northern states and heads of security agencies. Service chiefs and heads of intelligence agencies also met to map out new strategies to end incessant killings. One of the attendees after the meeting where the governor of Zamfara State. Joining us to discuss this is former Air Vice Marshal Femi Badebo. Thank you very much for joining us. We also have security expert Peter Aigbedio joining us as well. Thank you uh, both for joining us on the program. Thank you as well. Good evening, everybody. All right, let me start with you, uh, Mr. Gbadabo. What is your reaction to this latest meeting uh, to find a way to uh, resolve our security challenges? Well, it's like one meeting too many. We have had so many meetings, but just that in the past uh, couple of years, the whole emphasis of our security has been in the north. Uh, we're kind of lucky that things seem to have even tapered down in the south, well, in the south. And there are people who have been saying for a long time that uh, the idea of, you know, paying compensation to um, warlords in the south-south would have its repercussions. And we, we have had, we had relative peace in the northeast for a long time. Boko Haram is not gone there, even all the time they were bombing Kanu, Kaduna, and all those places. And, but we had a very disturbing uh, situation when we started hearing about Castle Rosling in the northeast. And it came to a head when the governor of Katsina even went into the bush uh, to hold a meeting with one of the uh, leaders of this, this gang. I, I, I remember his commission of police and one or two people were in his entourage. And that was quite disturbing. Uh, it's like, you know, who does that? Okay, obviously there would have been some settlements and some payments made. And the thing is, it's just like blackmail. Once you settle these people, they will keep coming back for more. And as you give them more, they become stronger and they take over more territory. And before you know what's happening, you lose control, like what we have seen now in Katina and going on to do. Uh, Sokoto. Um, so, yes, we could move in more troops to the northeast, right. but what happens to the north? We have not sorted out the northwest. Uh, before I go to Mr. Igbedio, I, I want to um, um, write off something you said about um, you give them an inch, they go a mile, just to paraphrase. The Zamfara state gov uh, governor came up with a comment again about repentant Boko Haram. Uh, he did say after the meeting that they have an understanding of what the security challenge is in that region and they are utilizing this repentant uh, Boko Haram um, and bandit uh, members uh, in the fight against insurgency and uh, crime in that area. What is your position on this continuing um, stance, so to speak, that repentant Boko Haram uh, members and other criminals um, are a way to fight crime in that region? A lot of people have raised observations about this issue of repentant uh, Boko Haram. Um, indoctrinating somebody to the extent that they can slaughter their fellow, not just fellow human beings, but their tribesmen um, on the basis of religion or something is not something that you can easily sort out in the classroom. 
Uh, it requires a lot of management and people like that. It's like, it's like telling me that you have a drug addict because he's, a, he's now he's recovered. You are not going to put him in charge of a drug selling uh, enterprise. He's going to be tempted at some time to taste it and go back into it. So even if we have them, we find them, why? I don't understand. How can you bring them back into battle? Um, there's a lot of things going on between the government and the military and those who are pushing for this rehabilitation and all that is not being made clear to, to Nigerians. And I think this is part of what is going on, that you, you have all kinds of forces. If you remember, before things got to this head, uh, the Air Force went ahead and built some helicopter landing pads and so on in the area. We had the period when the police even went in with their own helicopter, and I think the pilots got shot and so on. And every time you hear this thing, you're wondering, where is the synergy here? You know, how is everybody trying to get attention? Is it government, the president's attention or Nigerians' attention to show that they are the ones on top of the game? It, it's it's quite unfortunate that we don't seem to have any clarity on the issue of the repentant Boko Haram, especially when the uh, Zamfara state governor is saying that they have an understanding. I hope he wasn't misquoted uh, of the security situation in that region. Uh, let's bring Mr. Aigbedio into the conversation and take it from uh, the chief of air staff, Sadiq Abubakar, who spoke on Tuesday in Katsina and said that the Air Force destroyed 10 bandits camp in the last three days. Uh, we keep getting these updates from the military. My question is, how necessary are they when many Nigerians maintain staunch skepticism as to their validity? Well, the skepticism that uh, many Nigerians display um, is, I, I would say, is, is appropriate. There's been a huge trust deficit built over over the years, and especially since the Boko Haram um, insurgency um, reached the the, the, the the heights it has reached, if I use that phrase, so people are skeptical of what the military puts out as information. Many times they contradict, contradict themselves. The facts, the fact that it's put out, uh, are found to be to be far from the truth, either by either by uh, um, investigative journalists or from the communities um, who are victims of the situation. So the, the, the trust deficit that Nigerians have for what they hear from, from our spokespersons in the military is, is, is justified. Now, with what he has said now about um, how they are trying to, or, or the efforts that they are putting out there, I, I think he's saying this because they are on the back foot in a way. Um, a lot of, a lot of the, the, the ground has been gained by Boko Haram in terms of putting out their own information, because if you, or especially with social media, there's something they call cyber-enhanced influence campaigns or propaganda. So a lot of events that Boko Haram carries out are staged or heightened um, over social media. So in terms of information getting out, the, the Nigerian military is on the back foot. So when you see you see them putting out information like the, um, the, um, the chief of staff put out today, and I was wondering why is he telling us how many how many airplanes have been deployed there, how much um, jet fuel they have in the area. Those, those things are unnecessary, in my, in my view, to the, to the efforts that are on the ground. Just let us know you're putting out, you're, you're putting off your best efforts and we should, we should keep trusting. Anyways, I, I, I'd say they've done a, a, a shoddy job in terms of putting that information. So the trust deficit is definitely, yeah, definitely justified. One would say solid job will be reflected in the level of, the, of reduction of crime uh, in the country. But that doesn't seem to be the case because as it stands, we have this governor's uh, meeting trying to find a way out. Um, this administration's Minister of Information, Lai Mohammed, on June 14th, uh, said that the prevalence of insecurity in the country has reduced considerably uh, when you compare it with what we witnessed in 2019 within the same spirit. It was uh, specific about uh, banditry and kidnapping. Um, a fact check by the International Center for Investigative Reporting, that's the ICIR, confirms that there, there was indeed a drop in the incidence of kidnap cases uh, in the first half of 2020, unlike the figures we got in 2019. Um, I would now say optimistically, is this a plus as is being claimed by Lai Mohammed, or does it have to do with the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, to, be, to, be, to be modest, I think it's just soft history and I tend to, to pull the wool over our eyes. Um, first, if you look at the first time, of this 
this year. A lot of um, usually the, the modus operandi for these bandits have been attacking people in transit or in the villages and stuff. So we find that they to the criminals or these bandits, they, are, they, have, they, have, they have evolved in their operations. So they are no longer just targeting people who are traveling because nobody's traveling as, because of the lockdown um, from COVID-19. You find that their operations, their strategy has changed. They are attacking villages, they are burning down villages, they are pillaging, they are rampaging. So um, for him to say that, um, well, where there's, there's a less number in um, kidnapping and, um, and other, other um, crime in comparison to the bloodletting we are seeing in Casina. Casina has practically been overrun by these by this bandits. Um, he's been clever by half, and I think Nigerians deserve better than, than to have such, um, such sophistry displayed in our faces because people's, people's lives are being lost on, on practically a weekly basis, I put it, put it mildly. So I don't think the Minister for Information has been has been doing a good job in that area. And in fact, he has spoken for, he has had his foot in his mouth many times. I think he should stay out of the fray for now. Uh, Mr. Bedebo, the, the protests that rocked uh, Katsina's state, we, we saw plenty of youths take to the street and they are now threatening uh, to uh, engage in and self-help because of incessant killing and banditry uh, in the local government area. What is your concern when citizens get to the point that they now say, we don't trust the military anymore, we're going to protect ourselves? I don't think they're saying they don't trust the military anymore. It's that they're not seeing the military. Uh, the military is not on ground. Like I told you, the military had deployed heavily in the northeast for the past couple of years. Even if you notice, if you remember before we went into the lockdown, uh, the chief of army staff had to go and embed himself in the northeast, and that's why we didn't hear from him uh, for the better part of two months or three. So uh, it's, a, it's about now moving the troops there. And I think it is the lack of their presence that led the Air Force to try to take charge and for the police to, to try to carry out some police operations. So um, things are coming. But yeah, the young men are frustrated. It's not good to have them that frustrated. But we need to begin to understand that um, our local governments need to be empowered more than just one or two police posts so that when things like this come up, they can at least take care of the immediate vicinity where they are, chocolates of the various villages that are in the area. Our policing and our military operations have centered around our state capitals and have failed to grow in line with the size of our population and even the way we are saying our population is enlightened. This is where the problem is. So it's not just that you have a small police post. The police post is not equipped to, in terms of manpower and firepower to, to respond to some of the things that we're seeing here. So we must redesign uh, operations. I, when, the gov when the president came in, in uh, years ago, you remember the plan was to beef up the police force and to even beef up the, 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 the army. We must get to it. Look at what the UN says about, you know, the number of police uh, for a uh, number of people and so on, and you look at even what the army should do. We still have a lot of states where we don't have a brigade, not, or even maybe uh, a reasonable poli uh, army unit. And that creates a problem. Right. So we must, you know, if we don't have permanent presence, then you can't be talking of moving them. If you remember years ago, we had just a few mobile police units, and each time there was a crisis, you are moving them here and there. Now the Mopol's units have been, have been uh, expanded, I'll say. I don't know the exact details, but we still need a lot more. All right, let's people. bring Mr. Egbedio back into the conversation. I, I want to take it from um, another angle. Are we tackling crime the way we should, banditry, Boko Haram, or are they primary causes, roots that we are yet to address when it comes to the insecurity uh, in this particular area? Well, um... It goes without saying that crime, crime thrives in societies where governance is, is poor, where poverty is rife. Um, and a lot of, especially now in Nigeria, I mean, evidently Nigeria is, is a poor nation, to put it, to put it generously. Um, poverty is an incentive to crime of all kinds. 
So now that we're seeing um, po um, poverty statistics show that Nigeria is, uh, as somebody called it, public capital of the world, um, or one of the public you will see evidently that a lack of good governance will, will, will lead to escalation of crime or, or the incentive to commit crime. Um, because of that, it is important that government pays not just lip service, but pays close attention to these factors that are uh, allowing crime to increase and deal with them decisively. Um, AVM was saying a few, a, few, a few minutes ago about how um, before the, the, um, the, the number of um, mobile police um, personnel was less. I also remember that just, before, just when the Nigerian Civil War began, the Nigerian army recruited massively. Um, Nigeria is fighting a war, whether we like it or not. The, the, the terrorism campaign in the Northeast and, um, and as we see now, escalating to other parts of the North is war by other means, um, even if we don't want to call it that. It, 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 it is time for the Nigerian um, government to allow the armed forces to begin to, to not just recruit people, but in, even not, armed forces aside, from what EVM said a few minutes ago as well, too, the police as well, too, from the U.S. statistics, um, the U.M. recommends that there should be at least one policeman to 400 people. We, we are way, 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 way overstretched in our policing capacity. Um, the, the men are, are, are poorly motivated. I remember even the administration of, of President Gordon Jonathan that he visited the police college in Ikeja, Lagos, and the, the conditions that the, the our men were living in were, were not just deplorable, they were horrible. So how do you expect people to, to put out their best um, when they live in those kind of conditions? So there are lots of factors that, that lead to the escalation of the hostilities and crime we're seeing today. It is important that we begin to ha have, have those conversations now, to have a government that pays attention to them now, because with the post with, with the COVID-19 situation that has um, made economies of the world to be about to go into a recession that will last a long time, you will see crime spike. It's important that they begin to take those measures now before it becomes, before it becomes too late. All right, Mr. Egbejo, thank you very much for your input on the program tonight. Thank you very much. And Mr. Gwadebo, thank you as well for giving us uh, the wealth of your experience. Thank you for sharing them. Thank you very much. Right, we'll take a short break and when we return, the fight for the chairmanship of the ruling party APC is up for discussion. Just stay with us.